Up at a unicorn here with a bit of an inconvenient uh, truth. It's kind of a recycling back to an old message. I think it was a Shira Star goddess who coined the phrase Bonetta. I'm not saying she's the first ever to use it. I wouldn't know, but she definitely is the one to popularize it. And of course, because she's such a creative, I would say that that arguably that is her word. Anyhow, so... <laughs> We didn't get the message through the first time around. I don't know if this was like in 2018, 19, but maybe the second time's a charm. This is on wearing your bonnet out of the house. So to all my beautiful sisters, Afro-American, the verdict is in and the bonnet is out. The verdict in, bonnet out. Verdict in, bonnet out. We love a good silk or satin bonnet to protect our Afro-textured hair from the worst. Split ends, breakage, dryness, tangles, single strand knots, etc. Lord know what all happens in my hair. Our satin scarves help us to preserve our two-day hairstyles for up to an entire week. That's a blessing. Our bonnets keep lint out of our hair as well as our hair pieces for those of us who like to wear a little extra. I remember washing my hair and it's all clean and presentable and then, you know, nap time and then there's lint. And something about lint just obviously makes you look like, well, you just rolled out of bed, unkempt, and I mean, I had to fight that lint to get it out of my hair. It was like one or two pieces, but still... It was a battle, and I certainly wished at that moment that I had slept in my satin bonnet. So, um, I mean, satin bonnets and silk scarves, I mean, we should really expand that Philadelphia do-rag festival. It's like a holiday there or something. Like, we should expand that to include bonnets and scarves for all they do for us. Like, they're really one of the unsung heroes of the African-American community. So... So many times we are taught that it is a level of true confidence. And I don't know if we get this from the Gen X pick me's or the boomer pick me's, but we got taught by somebody that it was a display of true confidence to be able to leave the house and our bonnets, robes, and rollers because it displays that we aren't living for outside validation. Now, kudos to you if you can, like I can, run errands looking any kind of way without feeling any less beautiful as a result. However... And the vein of leveling up, I have to say, cut it out. I It's been a long time since I've run out of the house looking any kind of way. Like, I try not to leave the house without, you know, my hair is always done before I leave the house. But I try not to leave with like a bare face, for example. Now that masks are everywhere, it's very easy to just kind of put on mascara and go because you don't want all that lipstick or foundation on the inside of your mask. But certainly before then, you know... Makeup was the thing for me. Makeup and leggings was my uh, leaving the house faux pas that I shouldn't have done. And um, yeah, (laughs) well, it sends a message, probably not the message you're looking for. Um, I know personally myself, me and so many other school children, we would be so embarrassed when our moms come up to the school with their bonnets and house clothes on to turn in permission slips and last minute monies to fund them, right? To fund the field trips, I mean. We knew, right? Now, you know that your mother's beautiful. You see her on Christmas. You see her on Easter Sunday. You know what's going on with your mom's look. But it's a fist fight that leads to suspension when some kid makes fun of that, you know, makes fun of your mom or makes mean jokes about your mom. That's why your mama looked like the Wayne sister when she played Miss Jenkins on In Living Color. But I ain't want to gossip, so you ain't heard that from me. No, you haven't. I mean, this stuff was brutal, all right? Like, I don't even want to talk about, I think in first grade, I uh, I got sent home for, they said I stabbed this boy in the ear with a pencil, but I don't recall it. I remember his ear was bleeding. I don't remember that it was my fault. And I do remember being at the pencil sharpening machine, and I do remember him capping on my mom. <sighs> I think I was a... I was a first or second grader. I think I was a second grader, but y'all look, if that is how, if that's how leaving the house any kind of way can affect your kids, imagine how that affects your man. Like a leaving the home in your satin scarf or bonnet, it's a poor representation of the people you love and are associated with. If your children can be embarrassed 
then definitely the men you're with, the kind the company you work for, like it's it's a snowball effect really. Now with men, I know my man wouldn't want, you know, somebody to come across me after he spent months bragging on my beauty and here I am, you know, in a satin scarf looking like I just woke up. It's a social faux pas no matter how much we seek to normalize the behavior. We must leave our bonnets at home because they signal unkempt low worth. We got to treat our bonnets like they're pajamas because in reality, I mean, we sleep in them. We clean in them. We cook in them. Got to leave them at home. I've seen so many sisters at the airport sporting, sporting bonnets, you guys. And they're wearing them for good reason. I mean, to protect their hair on flights to those that they actually want to impress. As a minority group, however, that look is a representation of all of us, especially when you're in a place where there aren't that many African-American people. I remember when I was in college, I had a roommate who had never seen a black person in real life. I don't know what kind of a middle America she was from, but she'd never seen, like she'd only seen black people on TV. And even in 2021, there are still nation, I mean, nations, there are still cities and states that are that way. Needless to say that, you know, stereotypes hit us pretty hard and we're a group that has some of the most negative stereotyping, right? Like, um, I've heard Asians complain about the spirits, the stereotype of, oh, you must be smart because you're Asian, but that doesn't hit the same way as, oh, you must be dumb because you're black. Okay. It, it just doesn't like, which would you rather be, you know? So again, we have to, I guess the goal is to kind of, um, change our image as a group of women, right? Because being a minority means that the way that we represent ourselves, if one of us do it, people assume that all of us do it. And I see all these people talking about Tinder and OkCupid and whatever other trash dating app where it's like, oh, African-American women rank the lowest. It's not because we are the lowest. It's because their ideas of what we must be is the lowest. And it's kind of upon us to change that. <sighs> So when you leave the house in your bonnet, it sends a subconscious message to men that says this woman is less valuable than the one who is all gussied up and proper looking. Embellishing your looks is part and parcel of elevating your femininity. Honestly, one goes hand in hand with the other. Dressing down is an obvious and effective deterrent to every man but a dusty man because he sees you in your bonnet or he sees you in your silk or satin scarf and he imagines that you are as dusty as him. Even with your nails done, eyebrows done, makeup on, he sees that bonnet, he thinks dust. He thinks you are the broom to his dustpan and he will approach. Mm Mm-mm. Now, speaking of dressing down as a deterrent, I am not going to, like, I'm not going to cap here. Like, African-American women who grew up in inner cities especially have plenty of reason to dress down as a deterrent to sexual male attention. Getting hit on by a man only to get jumped by him and his aggressive friends, like the woman recently in New York who was mauled. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Mauled by that guy in the red jacket. I'm so glad he got caught. I hope the rest of his friends get caught. Um, if you know any updates, put them in the chat below because I want to know in the comment section below that is. So anyhow, like we'll reject these men, even if we do, even if we politely recall the decline, it ends up, you know, I call it pretty punishment or you end up being treated terribly for being attractive. I do understand how and why we have evolved this way. I know I used to sag my pants in middle school and dress like a boy. And for me, that was better than having my behind smacked by some teen on a bus or worse, an adult, because I'm in a form-fitting dress and they see my curves. I mean, we're a group of women known to dress down for very many reasons. Some of us dress down for work. Some of us dress down because we're in religious circles. Some of us dress down just to protect our private parts from violation for fear of sexual attention. And I'm not here to punish that because I completely understand psychologically where that comes from. However, I think we need to find a better way to do this. Again, it has to be a collective movement, a collective cultural movement to like 
not leave the house in that way. So something like an A-line dress and minimal nude color makeup, like with your hair pulled back into a tight bun, that expresses femininity without expressing sexuality, right? It's like when you see a Muslim woman in her hijab or a nun in her habit, like you can clearly see everything about those long flowing dresses, garments, whatever. There's femininity, but zero sexuality, So I'm just saying, like, if you want to dress down as a deterrent to sexual attention, I think that that's something worthy of looking into. Like I said earlier and have repeated here, the goal is to raise the the reputation of African-American women. I hate hearing you're different for a black girl or I didn't think you were black. I thought you were something else. And by black, you know, some people, you know, they use black as interchangeable with African-American. And I do that sometimes, too. Um... But of course, black is encompassing, you know, an entire, (laughs) I mean, mongoloid, negroid, caucasoid, it's encompassing anything that qualifies under that anthropological category as negroid, right? However, because of the way that I act or emote or carry myself, people will swear that I'm, I'm some kind of something else. I don't know how many times I have been approached by people who think I'm an Afro Latina or from the Middle East or from somewhere in Africa and they're just like, oh, you just seem different. Now, part of that I understand because I'm a well-traveled person. The other part of me, I'm just like, it's a backhanded compliment as if to say, you know, well, you're too good to be African-American. No. So that's a stereotype that I want to change. I mean, if you're talking etiquette and manners and just, I mean, some of the best teachers are African-American women for that okay like african americans have have centuries of class please don't get me wrong but i don't know if it's because of all the hip-hop pop culture whatever it is stereotyping if it bleeds it leads on the news but we've got a pretty nasty representation i think some of the cleanest people i've ever met in my life are african american people but for whatever reason it's like people will think that we're dirty and i'm just like how (laughs) what made you think but you know probably being associated heavily with homelessness makes people think that you know I mean so that's just one of those things but I mean I'd rather people stereotype us as looking like lost members of Destiny's Child or in Vogue as opposed to you know being the one-off oh you're different for a black girl right creating a new and more positive stereotype that benefits us all right I think this is what Chrissy refers to as um, corrective promotion, right? I would say it in, in the way that I said it, like creating a new and more positive stereotype that benefits us all. Because the reality is we can't get away from stereotypes. We really, really can't. No group of people is going to get away from stereotypes. Pakistani, Indian, subcontinent, this and that, Arab, European, African, North, East, South, West, Central African, like, like no one is going to escape their group stereotypes. So it behooves us to work as a group to create a new one, right? Let's say that whole strong black woman stereotype. We did that and colonialism did that, right? We did as much for that stereotype to be looked at as something where anytime I walk into a room, I intimidate all the women there. Even though I can be the sweetest, most gentle, whatever, like anytime I walk into a coffee shop, a, I mean, it, it could be a Kinko's, a restaurant, anything, I intimidate all the women there in general, not all the time, but in general. And they, it's like they just know that I'm stronger than them when in reality, maybe I'm not. Right. Um, the group thing as a group, it, it's just like as a group, we're known for weave. OK, even though so many of us are natural, so many of us don't wear fake hair, but like we're known for that weave. Right. Because we've done it so much as a group that it's stuck. So even when our hair is real, like Chime Edwards and Natural 85 and myself, people will still ask, you know, where'd you get your hair? And it's like, yeah, I grew it. (laughs) So anyhow, um, I thank you for watching this video with me. And I would love to see your suggestions in the comment section below regarding how you think that we can create more positive stereotypes for African-Americans. So like, share, comment, subscribe. I am uppity and I am out of here.